Allow me to welcome the moderator of the session today, Sai Satish Vedam. Sai is a senior faculty and head of products at the Institute and was most recently senior director of product management at Oracle. Welcome, Sai. Happy to have you here, handing the session over to you. Thank you, Menaka. Good morning, all of you. Uh, exciting and final day of the strategy edition of Product Leadership Festival. We've had superb sessions in the last four days. Um, in fact, I see we had definitely have a dip in the number of audience, uh, hope, you know, possibly because Saturday people wanted to take a break, but uh, we've had uh, 100 plus audience regularly joining in. I'm hoping that, uh, you know, people will trickle in, uh, but we'll get started. I think we have an exciting lineup today. Um, a very interesting topic with an, you know, a superbly qualified speaker uh, for this uh, session, the masterclass. And then um, a particularly exciting to me is the open conference uh, speakers from the community who have, uh, you know, volunteered to speak and talk on specific topics. And community has voted for all of them. And uh, we are uh, going to hear from the top three uh, submissions from there. So that's uh, going to be an exciting one. And of course, end it with um, you know, the other session. But uh, before uh, we kick this off, I'd like to just make sure that Prabhakar uh, is online and uh, we can see his video. If you can turn on the video, Prabhakar, and say hi, just to make sure that you are here. Hello, everyone. Hi, Satish. Hey, good. Good to see you. So I think I guess we'll, we'll get started. Uh, just uh, before we I introduce uh, you to the audience, uh, a quick announcement to all of you. Folks, uh, ask your questions in the Q&A window uh, instead of the chat window on the Zoom. There's uh, a lot of chatter in that. It's going to be hard to find your questions. And for those of you who are joining from on LinkedIn live stream, please uh, ask your questions there. Uh, the team will put together and we will take up any questions at the end of this. Uh, but without uh, much delay, I'd like to Welcome, and it's a pleasure to invite you, Prabhakar, uh, to this uh, event. Um, you know, looking forward to this exciting topic of, you know, many of us uh, come across different frameworks, paradigms around strategy, whether it is corporate strategy, business strategy, or product strategy. But I think what is, uh, what stumps many people is how do you translate that into action, some form of implementation or application of it. So Prabhakar is a chief revenue officer of Telivet. Um, he's got more than a couple of decades of experience uh, in product management, in marketing and strategy, has worked in leadership roles in several other companies before. Uh, he also uh, has a, a consulting uh, firm or an engagement with PG Consulting, which is primarily focused on helping CEOs, especially in B2B SaaS companies in their growth strategies and implementation services. and um, what I've, what I've gathered is uh, several folks who attend his workshops uh, or sessions uh, couldn't just stop raving about how impactful they are for them. So happy to have you here, uh, Prabhakar. And um, you know, before, we, before we jump into your session, uh, like every other session that we've done, I'd like to get a sense of or the pulse of the audience that we have today here, right? So just to know where they come from, what their backgrounds are, where they work. So, Menaka, if you could launch the first poll uh, to know, and so that you know the speaker also understands the background and uh, you know emphasize or de-emphasize accordingly. So, first one is about the organization that you work in currently. Uh, go ahead and take that quick poll. Tell us uh, what type of organization that you work in. Is it a, a, an early stage startup? Is it a IT services company? Uh, multinational or well-established product companies in India, right? So when I say well-established, um, we're, we're not we're talking about the companies that uh, started in India as startups and now have reached a let's say product market fit. Good, super. So again, uh, encourage all of you to uh, take few seconds to you know click on the choices in front of you so that it helps uh, all the audience and also the speaker to tweak or fine tune this. Good, so let's bring up the next poll. No, so I don't, no, I don't think this is the right poll. Yes. 
How many of you are, I mean, uh, you know, in the last few sessions we've seen majority of the audience come from product management background, Prabhakar. I think uh, they are current product managers uh, with at least about overall seven plus years experience. Uh, but uh, we're trying to see if this session is any different, any of them. So it's uh, interesting to see about, you know, 70% voted of it, 90% are looking to become as product managers, right? Uh, which is itself is an interesting number to see. Okay, great, thank you. Uh, the last uh, quick poll to see if we can get more clarity on our audience. So there are typical activities. I know uh, some interesting ones here, which many of us try to uh, juggle with every day. Uh, but uh, what are the typical and some multiple choice So choose as many as you do. Responding to customer support issues seems to be there. Uh, go ahead, folks. I know it takes a few seconds to go through the options. But if I were to start from the beginning, I would probably take every one of them. <laughs> Good. Let's run this for another few seconds and then uh, we can start. Networking in the industry, amazing. Looks like uh, a lot of folks are spending good amount of time doing that. Okay, things changing slightly. Okay, uh, that's great. Again, thank you all for taking the poll. So Prabhakar, hopefully this provides some glimpse. Of course, you know, if we keep asking a good set of questions, then you know, the rate of participation will decrease uh, in the polls itself. Uh, but over to you. Thank you, Slice. Appreciate it. Um, hopefully everybody can, you hear my audio well? Yes. Excellent. Well, um, first of all, I wanted to uh, thank the organizers, the Institute of Product Leadership for giving me this opportunity to connect with everyone here and uh, speak a few words on this topic. Um, and I uh, also want to thank uh, Saith Satish for the introduction and running the polls. So it gives me a glimpse of the kind of audience here. So uh, please feel free to submit a Q&A live. We can try to make this as interactive as possible. It looks like there are 20 plus uh, audience. I'm going to now share my screen for the presentation. Um, hopefully everybody can see. So my... Uh, actually, let me do this. Share. Application. Yep. Okay. So you can all see my uh, application here. All right. So how to move from strategy paradigms to strategy application. The topic looks like it's a lot, but uh, Trust me, it's actually a very simple um, set of things that we could discuss about. Now, um, I'll tell you from my experience, I, as Sai Satish mentioned, I had worked um, a long time ago in corporate strategy. So, you know, when you build a um, strategy for a large company, for example, uh, typically there is a corporate strategy department, then there is a business strategy department, then there is product strategy, and then there is, you know, um, other field level execution. There's this whole pyramid of strategy, but at the end of the day, um, all these, you know, strategy frameworks, all these need to be applied and put in practice. And I'm going to use the lens of a product manager to walk through that portion um, rather than, you know, building and deploying corporate strategy. So we'll, we'll put everything under the lens of product manager. So some of you may be familiar with this. Uh, there's you know a bunch of simple strategy frameworks like you know the BCG growth share matrix. You know that helps you figure out whether products can in your portfolio. You know you should continue to invest in it. You should divest. Um, so there are you know the dogs, the stars, the cash cows, and so on, and then question marks. Um, that's a very simple framework. Uh, Boston Consulting Group, Bruce Henderson and team came up with this uh, back in the 60s, 70s, 
And uh, it was a very simple framework for a large company to figure out how it should manage its portfolio of products. A much simpler strategy analysis tool is a, a SWOT analysis. You can figure out what your strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, threats are, and then accordingly figure out what the next step should be and how you should compete. Uh, in that space, one thing that you have is uh, one of those frameworks for industrial economics back in the day used to be Michael Porter's Five Forces. So there are numerous frameworks like these that is employed at every level of the strategy organization, be it corporate strategy, business strategy, or the uh, you know rank level product managers. But the key question is, if you ask yourself, how do you take this framework, the results of this, and how do you apply it on a daily basis, day-to-day -day basis, do you have, turns out most organizations don't have a framework for the application portion. While they do have a, a framework for running strategy sessions to figure out what to do, but the how to do, a set of very simple steps is often missing. Uh, and what most companies do is um, just do it very ad hoc, like, you know, come out of it, start doing the same thing that they were doing before, some changes there, here and, here and there. Some hire consulting companies and help them implement it. That's one way to do it. Um, but often the product managers in these kinds of environments don't have a framework or a tool to themselves use, assess what is it that they need to do how is their organization running? What can they do about it? Now, um, I don't necessarily know how I can pull the audience live, but uh, maybe a, a question or two on this, or maybe someone from the audience, even you can post in the Q&A, like, does this make sense? In the sense, like, do people in this agree? Have you experienced the situation where you come out of these sessions, but where's the implementation of it? Yeah? So, well, thank you, Ashutosh. Um, there's quite a few people there answering about it. So the question, like I mentioned, is like, you know, what steps would you take to implement it? What's the model for implementation? And you can Google this online. Like, how do you apply strategy, execute strategy, implement strategy? And the material there is very, very less. Um, so I'm going to give you a simple six point checklist, utterly simple, so simple that you're like, what's so Einstein about it. Um, and that is this, these are very simple six steps, no graphics, no pictures, no nothing. There's no need to be jazzy about this. It's just very, very basic. The first step is to define the objectives and KPIs. Um, if you do not have a, a clear set of objectives and KPIs, no strategy can get executed. Second, and you can actually go in this particular order even, is to describe it in a plan. Like what exactly are you going to do? Break it into chunks. The third is find the resources and allocate it. This is the central economic problem, allocation of resources. And four, execute the plan. Five, measure the KPIs. And six, report the feedback and adjust strategy. If you can assess your organization against these six traits of strategy implementation, you yourself will know, are you going in the right direction or not? And that's as simple as that. Now I'll go into detail in each one of these one by one. This makes sense? Everybody with me? All right, wonderful. So, um, so let me give you an example of what, what we mean by defining objectives and KPIs, right? So before you frame any, large, big objective, you have to have a certain things about the objective. What is the context of this objective? What's the time frame in which this objective is going to be executed? What are its dependencies, internal, external? And, and is this objective an aspirational one or is this a more uh, operational one, right? Something that people are going to do it on a daily basis or something that is more aspirational. And what, does, what is it doing to achieve the business goal? Oftentimes, if this part is not correct, the rest of everything on the organization doesn't work. 
And that's like, that's this is normally the problem is that poorly set objectives, poorly set KPIs result in poor outcomes. And I will challenge a lot of the organizations, large or small, if you don't have good objectives, like you know, look at your current objectives and tell me how many people really understand and make sense out of those objectives. I'll show you on the next slide. A good framework you can use for setting objectives and KPIs is OKRs. Anybody familiar with OKRs, objectives and key results? Like, um, all right, great. So some folks that are uh, familiar with OKRs, that's an excellent framework. So if, if you're able to, here's an example of an OKR or an objective and KPI. So look at the top one, launch Acme widget in Q2 with 300 daily active users. That's a very well-defined objective and a KPI there. Look at the next one, launch Acme widget in Q2. The difference between a good objective and a not so good objective is the 300 daily active users right here. That indicates whether this organization understands the why. Why would you launch widget? Like if you go and look at most plans, most uh, objectives, like we wanna go, you know, do this, do that. But for what, the why, does it actually contribute to the business goal? Often product management, one of the fundamental problems with product management is not aligned with the growth goal of the company, of the sales. A product management that is disconnected from sales in every step doesn't really actually is not useful to the company. Like the single purpose for the business to exist is the customer. And if there are no customers in the goal, that goal is not useful really, if it's not serving the customers. So I'm just illustrating just one simple uh, objective and KPI. If you go back and look at each one of your objectives, each one of your KPIs, ask yourself this hard question, like how much of the context is there? Is it about build, launch, you know, growth, retire some product stuff? You know, it, does it have a time frame built around it? Does it have internal, external dependencies? What kind of usage business goal is it being met? Is it about usage? Is it about conversion? Is it about, you know, some performance and availability factors? Unless you capture these things and yet make it simple enough that people can understand, this, the, without the objectives and the KPI, it is kind of very hard for the organization to do the rest of the work. And I, I, let me tell you one more important thing. You set this objective, but oftentimes, here's an example. If you aren't instrumented to figure out whether it's true or not, whether this is gonna be successful or not, that again tells you where the problems are, right? Well, there's a lot of organizations that cannot calculate the daily active users for their product. Assume it's a SaaS product, mobile product, whatever the case may be. So that itself is indicative of other systemic problems in the organization. Do you have the measurement instrumentation capability to have this number available real time for people in the organization to inspect? And so something so utterly simple, like, hey, tell me how many people are using the product today, you will be surprised how many organizations in the world, even you know, in advanced economies, cannot tell that quickly. The next step is describing the plan. And you know, I'm pretty sure all of you are very familiar with product roadmaps, sprint plans, Kanban boards, and all that stuff. The content is there in the plan, but the key is how are you devoting your resources in the work streams in these groups? So for example, if most of your investment in time is in bug fixes, that's again indicative that the product is not stable the product is having issues, poor requirements or poor uh, you know, uh, product development leading to bug physics getting most of the time uh, priority in the product plan. If most of it is on sales, the organization is very focused on current business, unable to meet the needs of the customers that are using the product. So how do you bucket resources in terms of product 
development in these buckets, whether it's a sales, customers, bug fixes, or other aspects. And oftentimes you find product um, in product planning sessions, this simple categorization is missing again. Um, so it's important to figure out the objectives. Are they aligned towards meeting the business goal of increasing sales or increasing customer satisfaction or in, you know, reducing poor quality at you know, fixing the bugs? What exactly is the objective aligned to? And it can be more than one if you have separated out. But you as a product manager going into the organization and looking at the strategy, we want to you know, gain market share XYZ uh, product this much percent, but the, when the rubber meets the road and double clicking that and getting to the product plan, and you see that most of the features that are being developed or most of the bugs that are being fixed are not aligned with that business goal, it's kind of very hard to um, meet the objective, right? So that's, that's a very implementation concern. The third one is allocating the resources. You put your fancy product roadmap, You've said all these things are going to come out in these in these in this time frame, but wait a second. Do you have the right resources? Do you have the bandwidth? Do you have the right you know leadership in the organization? The culture to execute that? Is there adequate staffing? All of these are very important for the product manager to understand and communicate upstream, communicate downstream, and sideways to the to the organization. And a whole bunch of this. Uh, you know, comes in navigating the internal politics of the organization as well, your ability to influence without having uh, any direct reports, right? When you think about allocating resources from product manager angle, it's not about um, you having direct authority or um, power in hiring and firing people, it's more about influencing the resources, influencing the leaders in the organization to move towards uh, these areas, right? And that's an art by itself. Uh, and then the next one is executing the plan. So, you, so if you look back from the top, you have the objectives, you have the um, you know content and description for these things, uh, for these KPIs. Then you built the the plan. Now you're executing the plan. What steps are in your product roadmap that align with shipping um, these features? Are they just MVP? Are they feature complete? Are they whole product? And how are the you know, customers going to use it? So oftentimes, here's what I have seen in, in strategy implementation where the failure happens is people go and say, I'm gonna, this is just an MVP, I'm just testing it. But there's no follow through of what happens after the MVP has been launched. You look at the three month plan, two month plan, six month plan. We are testing this. So the, the normal process, what happens is this is just the first test, the MVP minimum viable product, but there is no sequence after it, a follow through. What if that MVP becomes successful? What other things would you do to continue to build on it and get it to feature complete? Normal product roadmaps, I rarely find product managers taking the, making the due diligence to go and build these other aspects in it. So there's no hypothesis testing around um, those product roadmaps going in direction one or direction two, no, you know, no elements for this. These simple things can have immense value to the organization if you're able to, you know, think through and build it. Um, and most importantly, you know, is execution simply shipping? Is that what it is, or is it beyond that? Right? Is actually going and checking if people are using it, and that leads us to the 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 next one, which is measuring capabilities. This is my favorite aspect of this entire you know, strategy implementation is what fundamental KPIs does your organization have you know, for key performance indicators? And coming from a developer standpoint, it's very simple to look at Little's Law, Kanban metrics. These are so fundamental. It's like laws of physics. Like I can take and look at an organization, uh, look at a product team and tell is it good or bad by just looking at these metrics throughput right how much how many items are delivered in a unit time that's throughput very simple definition right so is the organization productive or not its productivity can be measured just by throughput alone it's like how many features are you deploying are you deploying it on daily basis weekly basis monthly basis and how much is that right 
you know, great organizations that have high productivity will have high throughput automatically by definition, right? So just one metric really tells me whether this is a high performance organization or not. The inverse of throughput is cycle time, right? In a single unit of time, how much, um, you know, material moves. Cycle time is the time between those two columns in your Kanban board. Like, are you processing at a, at a rapid pace or not? And that is another sense of a sense of urgency in the organization, ability to de deploy things quickly. The rest of the organizational makeup can all be done by, and if you want to implement strategy, I would go and look at these metrics, instrument them inside the product, inside the process, inside the organization to figure out. And then work in progress, you know, the relationship between work in progress, throughput and cycle time, you can read Ludl's law and find out. But work in progress basically tells how much is sitting there, just work getting work done. Because if you have high throughput, then your work in progress is gonna shrink. At steady state, you will have higher throughput, smaller cycle time, and faster work in progress. But um, so those three are related and it's super important as a product manager to understand when you study development metrics, how development teams, you know, cumulative flow diagrams, how quickly they can spin up something and deliver this to the market. If you didn't have these metrics, you, each time you're going and asking, how long will it take for you to do this? How long will it take for you to do this? And there's all this back and forth, but a smart product manager would quickly understand through historical you know, community flow diagrams, how fast can an organization produce these things and what does it take for the organization to deliver at the time of planning, not at the time of implementation. It's mostly late by the time of implementation. Now, given all this, quality becomes essential after all of this, right? If you can produce fast stuff quickly, but it's always having poor quality. What's the use of delivering anything? So measuring the KPIs is an important aspect of implementation. The last one is this similar to the metrics and measurement is watching the customers, listening to the customers, talking to the customers. All these things are essential for adjusting strategy. It's not simply, as I mentioned before, Executing means not shipping code, but actually seeing how it is being used, how this particular product feature is being used. Is it, you know, the day you ship, you better have a hypothesis around, you know, X number of people are gonna benefit from this, X number of people are going to use this. And this is my expectation that, you know, the success of this particular release is gonna be determined by so many people using at this rate for this reason. There are so many features inside a product that people don't even click ever use. They're getting shipped every day. So much wastage, right? This is uh, in the Kanban terms, Muda. And so all that wastage can be avoided if you had real good hypothesis testing from the beginning. And the one way to do it is by first talking to customers before a single line of code is built. Like if you go back and look at your current roadmap, current sprint plan, current Kanban board, and ask yourself as a product manager, as an engineer, how many of those tasks on the board, how many of those things have actually come from talking to a real customer and figuring out that that is their need? Or is this just made up in a room? You will be surprised. The sheer number of things that are put on that development board that have come being are from not talking to customers. Anybody agrees with me on that? Talking to customers is not talking to customers and putting stuff on the board. So if you, if you think about it, that's all wastage. And then you spend so much time later addressing the customers, uh, you know, questions. Now, where do you get those insights? One insight is, of course, you first go talk to them. That's very you know, easier said than done, but there is low hanging fruit in this. And that is listening to customers, users. How do you listen to customers? Like are your sales team calls recorded? Are your customer success team calls recorded? That's a very simple thing. If your product is instrumented, process and instrumented, you, know, you can sit all day and listen to customer calls. And even better, you can just go shadow the sales team and get on the demos that they're doing to the, to the 
the prospects. You know, I have rarely seen product managers engage at a level that they should be engaging in to get these. And so you have a map, you have a world filled with lots of products that are slightly, just ever so slightly, not up to the mark. Only very few products are like delightful. Every product seems to have this or that, you know, not working. Why is that? It's because not enough work is put into defining, and there's so much wastage of all these features around the product. If only people would talk to the customer, listen to the customer and avoid all the chart junk, all the junk that's, you know, we'd have less products, but more useful, more functional, right? This is, um, that's what design is about, removing all that noise and nonsense. Lastly, after you've done all this, watch the customers. If you watch, you know, how the customers are using the product, there are all kinds of products these days, right? You can do mouse tracking, user tracking, there are products like Full Story, Log Rocket, and so on. You can just see how people are using the product and get an idea about why is it that they're going through this particular customer journey or user path. Um, then even as you deploy this, your competitors are also, it's not a static market, it's a chessboard. You make a move, somebody else makes a move too. And oftentimes the strategy implementation seems to be one-sided where you go deploy your strategy and sit back and expect some results. While you're implementing a strategy, somebody is countering that at that very moment too. Other people are waking up and doing the same thing or different things. How do you take that portion and go back and adjust your strategy? If your organizational process doesn't allow you for that, if we have not built a process of communication in the organization to build that, then no strategy implementation is successful. So, and that's the piece called back briefing. So uh, you can look up back briefing and it comes from a military term. Back in the day when uh, militaries uh, were having strategies, not only were they having briefing, but also the field officers would go back and brief the result of the execution of the strategy. So going and deploying the strategy is one thing, but how is it working? And can we adjust the strategy because of a counter move from the, from the competitor or from listening to customers, understanding sales and things like that? can mold your strategy and quickly allow you to adapt to the market. And so that's the um, you know, last piece of it. So I'm gonna stop here. I've been going on and on, especially on these webinars, you kind of, you do it with no feedback, it's kind of hard to uh, go. But I'm gonna stop here and ask yourself, okay, here are the six things, right? What are the implementation, I call these traits, definition of an objective and a KPI, describing the plan, allocating the resources, executing the plan, measuring the KPIs, reporting, adjusting a strategy. If you look at it, give yourself a rating of one to five for your organization, total it up and tell me, somebody put on the, you know, on the chat, what do you think your organization, I'm just curious, what do you think your organization's overall strategy implementation process maturities are on? Is it a 12? Is it an 18? Is it a 24? Is it a, you know, 6, 5, 30? How, how does, you know, everybody here feel about this, right? Or do you think that strategy is getting implemented systematically with a good framework and a lot of uh, diligence in each aspect of this? Any takers? Anybody wants to put in a few numbers? I think you've given them uh, something to calculate, compute, and think about. So I'm sure they're going to take some time. Uh, you know, especially when we ask uh, questions like this uh, systematically, this prescriptively, it might take um, you know people to put together. Is this really happening in my organization? Maybe, maybe not, because I don't even know. Right. Uh, some folks who are familiar with, of course, they will. Uh, but it's a, this is a brilliant way of forcing not only one's thinking, but also going back and asking these questions within the organization. Right. Sorry, I, I kept my video. What do you what do you say, um, Prabhakar? Is this a good trigger point? Yeah. So uh, a, a good, I, uh, yeah. To, I to agree with you. It's okay. not um, this is like introspection, right? If everybody wants um, some one thing to go and do, but 
we got to take a step back and ask ourselves, like, you know, if you ask, like, tell me that I, I don't want to ask a IPL, for example, but any organization, like, you know, hey, what's your objective? What are the KPIs for this quarter? You just yeah. stop someone in the, uh, you know, in the office and ask. Yeah. Most people can't tell that. Yeah, well, that's a really bad situation. Uh, I mean, the, the basic ones are not even met. Uh, so, let, you know, then it doesn't make sense to even talk about the rest of the things, I suppose. <laughs> right. And then so you go down, but the question is about, like, how do you design these things with there's so much work involved in execution and implementation. This is a full, full on operational. This is where operations is, right? Strategy is like figuring out what yeah. to do but the operations portion is much harder because everybody can say, we want to be, uh, strategy is saying what I want to be, yeah. right? I want to be number one in this is a good strat. Is that alone does not make strategy, execute it, show it to me. And then show it to me is setting very, very concrete goals and objectives in small bites, right? You can't eat the elephant in one bite, mm -hmm. yeah, you know? And so cutting it down in a small pieces and then uh, how do you allocate resources just to get that much? Do you have the right people? Yeah. It's, it is a very much in the present. No, that, that, that is a particularly interesting one on the allocation of resources because often within organizations, teams and team leaders and managers that are making the case to get more resource, often it's an emotional one, right? Rather than driven by you know, if we need to meet these objectives and these are the metrics to meet and this is our plan to do it, well, we got to have more people to do it, right? As opposed to, look, we, we are doing so many initiatives, we just need more people. And, and that becomes a, an emotional conversation. And when uh, that doesn't happen, the allocation of resources doesn't happen, then everybody believes that, uh, okay, so this is not going to happen anymore. Right, this objective, yeah. and that's and, a bad way to get in. And, and people just repeat that cycle quarter after quarter, like, you know, and the faith in the organization, especially large organizations I've seen, well, one of the problems they have is like, they can't meet dead, like there's no reliability of like, I can consistently expect this thing at the end of the quarter, middle of the, you know, those, yeah. um, and then startups, that's a completely lazy fair environment where today you do this, tomorrow you do that, day after tomorrow you do that with no, um, you know, real plan around mm -hmm. like, here's strategic intent, here are the users, and here's my hypothesis testing around it. Like there is no, uh, and that I think like only when we build this culture of mm -hmm. discipline and mm -hmm. orderliness and systematic, you know, approach towards it, yeah. can we be successful. Good products, get products. If you really see successful organizations, not necessarily throughout their lifetime, but in the times that they succeed and make wonderful things, they do apply a very high degree of rigor in getting that thing going. Mm. So I, I just brought that up uh, because, you know, this is something that the participants here can take this and, and try to get answers within their organizations at a later stage, right? They may not have the answers right now. And especially given the, the audience that we have, uh, definitely probably not the full picture of it right so okay. so i'll let you continue um and then there are several questions uh, good questions popping up around oh you're you're, you're almost done that's not that was my uh last okay. slide really I, I i wanted to have people uh you know yeah. look at this and see um let's see what questions do you people have okay so, so let me quickly summarize from what uh, you know I've been gathering on this session. You started out with uh, you know there are lots of these uh, frameworks, methodologies on what to do, right? What what are the frameworks available? Strategic frameworks, but there's very less available on a deep diving into any of those things. First of all, I think um, it'll also be good to know from you if there is. Um, you know, what dictates a preference towards a strategic framework within organization? Is it uh, a hippo element or is it uh, some form of, uh, here is where we are in our journey in the product life cycle. And hence this might be the right set of methodology or framework to choose from. 
And sure. then, of course, the big part and the most of the chunk that you also described and spent time on is on creating an implementation mechanism, how to do that part of it, right? Yeah. So, um, and, and uh, I love the really very prescriptive six steps that you've given. Now, of course, each of them, while it seems like a checklist, it could take literally years for an organization to have many of them in place uh, for this machinery to be running smoothly, right? So, uh, and, and that is where a, a lot of people who are in the product teams kind of get daunted and also frustrated because um, there is uh, so much interdependency on some of these things that often it resorts to, oh, if we don't have that, then we can't do this. So, which means let's not, you know, I don't know how to proceed further anymore. So in your discussions with the CEOs, in your conversations with companies, I'm assuming that um, such scenarios are common, right? So yeah. what do you advise them? Uh, sure. And especially for our audience, uh, where they may not be pervy to all of these things, depending yeah. on where they sit, right? So what is, what, is, what, are, what is your advice for these folks to actually go sure. and get that information? I think that's probably a lot more relevant uh, for, for the folks here. So I think maybe, you know, I can answer in a few ways, yeah. the few areas here. One is overall for every em employee, um, always want to look at growth as the fundamental growth. When I say growth, revenue growth, this is the absolute necessity for the business. Every employee should really consider themselves like the CEO, a mini CEO. They have seen some of the presentations here at IPL talking about the mini CEO stuff. And the reality is, if you don't believe, consider yourself as a business owner, what you would do for the business, it is very hard. Like, it's one thing to say, I'm not up there, so I'm just gonna work in my little silo here. No, 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 don't do that. Think, regardless of what your role is in the company, when you're actually thinking for the company, think for the company, not for yourself. Like, and what that thinking is, the atomic, Part of that is revenue growth. There is no other reason, like everything else, you're fancy. I think that would be a great user experience. Don't do it in isolation because it has no consequence whatsoever if you're a product manager and say, I want to give a stellar user experience. Scratch it. It's not about user experience. I want excellent revenue growth. I want to help my sales team. And one of the areas which can help get that revenue is this user experience can actually do can convert into whatever objective KPI that can actually make that revenue because mm -hmm. instead of clicking six things, now they're only clicking one. And because of the reduced clicks, more the engagement. more engagement is better. Yes, the user is getting to, and whatever that will get to the revenue portion. So always be the, uh, uh, my singular advice is that look at revenue growth. What you're doing, can you draw a line, straight line to revenue growth? If not, don't do that work. That's waste. That's <laughs> as, you know, a lot of people want to, it's not an art project, too bad. <laughs> Somebody's job is on the line here. So do that. The second one, um, so first one I answered was like, I'm not up or down in the organization. Regardless of that, you know, consider yourself like, think of it like the company. Second is revenue growth. And Third, be very aligned. I'd say be very aligned to sales. I know it's very common in most organizations, like product management seems to have a bad vibe with sales. I find it like I go, I went in as a product, as an engineer, then as a product manager, product marketer, corporate strategy, consulting, and then customer success and then sales. So that, and what I have found throughout is that the one thing is customer want is what drives everything. So rather than dissing the sales team, figure out how you can help partner with sales and make the team successful. That's when the CEO really is paying attention to you product management when you align with sales. Yeah. So otherwise product management, CEO is about top line growth, period. Mm -hmm. The market is about top line growth. The stock market is about top line growth. And here you have entire product, the entire product management organization saying, I'm not having a seat at the table. Well, of course you're not going to have because your alignment with sales is not there. How about you figure out 
what is it that you're going to do that's going to you know make sales grow yep. that is the answer absolutely i think uh, that is the right way to look at it behave work towards um if the organization is emphasizing the objectives you know whatever you do you do amazing ux user experience brilliant features high performance scalability quality and all of that are geared towards that one particular objective which is top line growth right but we also recognize and acknowledge that for many companies that may not be the primary growth uh, at different stages right so you know i've also been in organizations where for a long time revenue 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 right and then suddenly we say no look next three quarters our focus is you know uh, entering new markets right um, you know uh, so so especially markets that we have never played before now which means try and understanding what those market needs are and all of that eventually the goal will become revenue or growth right but there could be intermediary goals towards it so hence uh, uh you know any differences or any changes you you would think that would need yeah. to happen in this approach if the primary objective for at that stage is not growth exactly then so you're not immediately going to have people you know take out their wallets and pay but mm -hmm. they are going to use the product yeah. right yeah. They, you're going to get more proof of concepts testing you know what simple usage users right there may there may be a you know free to pay model whatever it is but user growth like some proxy for revenue typically is interest usage and usage is such a high proxy in fact it many times uh is a better proxy than because revenue models can change sure. but if people are using it that's great so the base of the this pyramid is really usage if you can get people to use your product you have accomplished like the stickiness everything is in it and so in those cases i would say uh, launching whatever minimum viable product into those new markets to understand are you getting traction so the other way on re revenue is traction that would be my you know recommendation super so i think uh, there's a very interesting question um from tarun um on the frameworks we've been talking about right and of course not just those swart and you know ancel or uh, or bcg or any of yeah. those things but also the very prescriptive implementation framework the the how part of it um if it, should that be a top down approach which means that if you know if you look at uh, the steps that you prescribe requires alignment uh, and support and collaboration from many different or uh, you know business units or teams within the organization right uh, you said if you don't know today what your active users are now that may come from a, a different place, different set of pe people who are there so which alignment towards that goal is critical before before you start executing this strategy so the question is is that a prerequisite to have number one uh, the, i think the first part of the question is who decides what framework what approach to use is it top the second part is um bringing everybody in alignment is from a common sense point of view critical but it doesn't happen often so which means that if if that is not there should we not do strategy yeah I mean, should we not implement you yeah, know every yeah. company says that they have a strategy but you know there is strategy and there is strategy yeah i you know i worked at uh, in my experience two very large organizations i worked at IBM I worked at Dell both were over 100,000 employees I worked at mid-sized organizations 5,000 at that time Red Hat and CA 12,000 I've also worked at numerous startups and back of the napkin startups which are like me and co-founder working together yeah. so have, having experienced this uh, fortunately in all of these environments I think that strategy is a must strategy alignment like no strategy is not a good idea <laughs> so in all of this everyone had a strategy everyone knew it's like a, a gps i'm going in the direction now which route they're taking is the question and who decides that um it depends on the you know the nature of the strategy we're talking about every company should have the ceo owns the strategy there is 
they, it absolutely owns the strategy. Now, the executive team, uh, the OKR framework to me is one of the best frameworks. And I actually worked in a company where we built a product for OKRs. And so I'm slightly biased in that way, but I found the value of it as some a person that built an OKR product. So one of the questions here, somebody asked Tarun, he's like, some want to use OKRs, others not want to ever. So that's a very, you know, unfortunately that's not a good idea. I think that it should be rolled out top down from the CEO down to the last employee, everybody should use it. Like this is when I want to use what I want to do, others will do what they want to do. How does that work? You know, left hand needs to, you know, talk to right hand. And so if you want a functioning good organization, engineering and product management should really be aligned to the product delivery goal. So the CEO would have said like that example, Q2 deliver, you know, Acme widget with hundred active users or whatever, then there is a quality goal around it. There is a shipping goal around it. There is a usage goal around it. All these goals are, these KPIs are, you know, results. Some, an engineer signs up, an engineering leader, a product leader yeah. signs up. They're, you're all aligned. So I don't see how engineering can use OKRs, but others not use, it's not going to work. Yeah, I think that, that's true. So the message clearly to everyone and uh, also to the person who asked this question is like alignment is super critical. Uh, so if not, you know, you can't wait for everybody to say we are all ready to go, but we need to move that in incremental steps. So thank you so much, Prabhakar. Uh, we are just uh, around, uh, you know, close to the top of the hour. Um, appreciate you really taking your time in your uh, evening, night and joining us here. Uh, we, I, I really wish that we had a lot more like yesterday and day before, but I suppose uh, Saturday, you know, seems to kick in. But um, uh, thank you so much for those uh, very specific pieces of uh, advice, almost like a checklist, right? Now each like, checklist explodes into 20 more steps uh, and that's fine, right? So good. So before we let you go, I wanted to make a quick announcement uh, here. Uh, folks, uh, this is a very interesting product community in India that, uh, you know, as part of uh, one of the main goals of having these festivals and sessions is to build a community and nurture the community, right? So there are already thousand plus people, you know, started uh, joining this, sharing their uh, information, resources, um, knowledge, discussions, curated videos, and of course, more importantly, a lot of people talking about career opportunities in product management. Since we saw a lot of people are aspiring to be product manager, this is a good place to go and, and, and also look at that part, right? So uh, feel free to join, it's free, community.productleadersforum.org or scan your uh, scan the QR code here. And there's also a mobile app that um, you, you can uh, you know join this from anywhere. All right, um, and um, this is another exciting one. Personally, I'm, I'm quite excited about this. Uh, there are a few members from the product community in India, as well as IPL alumni are driving this initiative of conducting a benchmark study uh, to understand the status of product management and leadership in India. Um, IPL also does this, uh, did this in the previous years. So, you know, the goal is to reach out to at least 5,000 product managers and product leaders in this country and, and uh, you know, request them to take this uh, survey. Interesting.today slash benchmark study is the URL. Uh, don't take it now. It's, it, it will take uh, at least about 10 minutes for you to do that. You can do it later. And once you do that, you get a nice report uh, for you that gives you uh, trends, career paths in product management, salary levels, um, you know, very specific skills, uh, tips to excel in product roles and uh, product leadership roles. And if you are in HR or CXOs, you know, some design suggestions that other people have done on setting up and growing product organization, right? So please do uh, go ahead and take that survey. Now, uh, Prabhakar, again, uh, appreciate your time. And as a token of uh, a small gesture from us, please accept this uh, certificate um, of you know, appreciation. Thank you so much for joining. And one small request to you, um, if you know, in the LinkedIn thread, if you see any questions that got unanswered in this discussion, uh, if whenever you can spend some time and, and um, give that guidance to them, that will be helpful. Appreciate it. Right. Thank you, Sai Satish. Have a wonderful day.